You are live. Okay. Hello. Um, customization. Let's see. Making sure that I did the audio correct. If there's anybody on the stream, how's the volume? <laughs> Does that mean that the volume is good, <laughs> Jordan? <laughs> I think it's on slow mode. Copy link. I'll put a link in here. Announcements. I don't think I can do announcements anymore. Now. Oh, we got three folks. Okay. Um, all right. Jordan just gave me a uh, an emoji, but I don't know if that means that the sound is good. So if the sound is good, someone let me know. Because the little the little indicator is is not uh it's only going up to like one dot. Sound is good. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I guess let's go ahead and get started. So today's podcast, I think, is going to focus on centralization or decentralization, rather, the opposite. <laughs> okay, audio is good. Um, yeah. So hopefully, we'll get more people streaming in here as we go. Um, yeah, so, well, first, uh, shortly after my last video today, OpenAI posted their whisper. Um, uh, what was it? Law, the, uh, the whatchamacallit, the um, ASR, Automated Speech Recognition. So OpenAI, let me bring it up. OpenAI Whisper, introducing Whisper. So seven hours ago, um, they did... Uh, we've trained and are open sourcing a neural net called Whisper that approaches human level robustness and accuracy on English speech recognition. Um, so, yeah, basically what this does is it creates, you take audio and you create a spectrogram, which is an image um, of, of, the, of the, the registers of all the different uh, frequencies, and then you decode that into language. Um, this this so ASR has been around for a while, um, and it's just getting increasingly more sophisticated. So, for instance, YouTube, which we're on right now, has their own ASR engine in the background, and that's how it does automatic captioning. Um, yeah, so it's pretty interesting. I saw someone on Twitter say that they already used it. So um, I don't know. Uh, the code is on is up on GitHub. So I think uh, I think you can you can just do it. Yeah, um, we used Python 3.9.9, PyTorch, FFmpeg Python, Hugging Face Transformers. Yeah, so if you look at it on um, on GitHub, it looks like, let's see, import whisper model equals whisper load base. Yeah, they've got it pretty, pretty straightforward, ready to go. Um, I'll post a link in the chat, and if I remember... I sent a collab in the Discord. Oh, okay, cool. So Jordan, I didn't see, uh, but Jordan had already posted a collab notebook for Whisper in in our Discord. Um, yeah, so it's super straightforward. Um, looks like it's pretty easy to use, which is nice. Um, I don't know how much memory it takes. Um, typically, so for a while, ASR was was uh, resource intensive enough that you'd have to run it on a server. Or you know, in the cloud or something, but um, certainly with uh, with recent advances and also just how big GPUs are, um, ASR is probably something that you can run locally. Um, let me see if I can find a uh, how many gigabytes you need. Um, required VRAM. Okay, here it is. 
So the tiny version is 300 or 39 million parameters and it takes one gigabyte. Um, relative speed 32x, so it's pretty fast. There are five model sizes with four English only versions offering speed and accuracy trade offs. Okay, so the smaller, the faster, obviously, or maybe not obviously. Um, but so you can do faster than real time inference. So the fact that the smallest one takes about one gigabyte, that is getting to the point where you can run it locally. And so this is interesting because we just, um, in my video earlier today, I, I posted about the Orin, um, which is the NVIDIA like embedded or mobile. Sorry, my ear just started ringing. You ever have that happen where you're like, you're in the middle of talking and like your ear just starts ringing and it's like, yeah, or is that just me? I'm weird. Anyways, um, it's going away now. So the Orin um, has, what is it? I think it's got a, a four and an eight gigabyte GPU option. So that means that some of these, some of these smaller versions of OpenAI Whisper, um, up to so there's the tiny, there's base, there and there's small. So I think you can run each of those on a mobile device now. So this is different because um, up until now, things like um, Alexa and you know on your phone or whatever, um, any any voice recognition. Um, almost all of it had to be sent up to the cloud. And so it's kind of streaming up to the cloud and the inference is running on hardware on somebody else's hardware. But with advancements like this, that allows you to run it locally. So this is gonna be really important as we move towards an AI saturated world. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that soon. I, I've learned a lot today. Um, and there's ideas that are kicking around that I thought were like decades out, but they're actually like, years away, not decades. Um, but yeah, so as as transformers and, and neural networks, um, as we find new efficiencies and the hardware gets better. So on the one hand, like we're getting new capabilities. And for a while, people were like, oh, scale is all you need. Scale is all you need. Um, but we're finding that that's not true. Um, we're actually finding that more efficient algorithms are all you need. Um, so, so between more efficient algorithms and better distillation of neural networks, and then better hardware. So you're gonna kind of like meet in the middle, right? Like you've got one thing coming up and the other thing going down, and so they're gonna meet pretty soon. This happens with technologies all the time. The same thing happened with solar energy over the last few years. So like the cost of solar was plummeting, and then the efficiency of solar was going up, and so then finally they reach parity and solar is uh, commercially viable. And so what I suspect is that we're gonna start hitting that point with a lot of AI technologies. Um, you know, cause there's all, there's all kinds of people on Twitter that say AI hasn't done anything. And it's like the fact that you're using Twitter and that you see tweets that are relevant to you, that is AI. There was actually a really great, I think it was on Medium. It was talking about how NLP is, is it's so, um, it's invisible to us because we don't see it when it works. And that's actually most AI. If AI is good, you don't notice it because something just pops into your newsfeed, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Google Newsfeed or whatever, and it's directly relevant to you. Um, that's artificial intelligence running in the background. And some of it is very sophisticated. Some of it isn't. Some of it is just, you know, some basic pattern matching. Some of it is very sophisticated. Anyways, the rambling, the point is that as these models get smaller and more efficient and the hardware gets better, you're gonna be able to run everything on your phone before too long, which means you own all the data um, and you can decouple from you know, the Amazons and the Googles and the Microsofts. Um, and so we will get to a future kind of more like Star Wars where you can have your own droid, right? And your droid is just a self-contained you know, robot that you own and you own its data and you own its labor. Um, that's going to be possible sooner rather than later, um, and I'm surprised at how much we've how much acceleration we've seen this year. Okay, so that was a ramble. Let me check on the comments to see. Let's see, we got Adrian jumped in, was just testing the collab. Um, so yeah, Adrian, if you uh, if you post some some comments or something, if you put it over in Discord because I'm monitoring Discord too, um, you can you can uh, chat in real time, and I'll share any any ideas or thoughts that you guys have. Um, but yeah, so that was the first thing. Um, so yeah, now I'm talking, I was talking about, uh, an AI saturated future where be between having more hardware or better hardware and smaller models, we'll get to a point where we have, um, we have even more AI just everywhere. 
Um, let's see. So the other big thing was I had a chance to speak with the with a, a couple of, of the folks from Tau earlier. So Tau, if you're not familiar, is let me bring up their homepage so I can just eat, read off of it. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a DAO that it's T A U. Um, and it's a DAO is a distributed autonomous network or uh, autonomous organization. Um, but it's not just a DAO, like right? So a DAO um, is a way to basically uh, run some kind of organization. You can run a private company. You could run a church. You could run a small town, whatever. You can run it um, with it. And it's a, it's a system of governance, right? Because uh, it runs on blockchain, which gives you either a public or private distributed ledger. So all the officers and the governance and the rules, everything can be integrated into a distributed autonomous organization. Um, and then all the rules are executed programmatically. So the governance doesn't even require enforcement from outside authorities. It is a self-stabilizing governance. Okay, great. So what is the differentiating factor of Tau? Right there is it. It has it's a distributed autonomous organization. They've got a cryptocurrency. Okay, great. Like, how does that? What's different about it from everything else? The differentiating factor of Tau is that they are integrating distributed um, artificial intelligence and a number of other things. Now, um, distributing code that's nothing entirely new. You can do this with Ethereum as well. So Ethereum is by far the most the biggest most popular blockchain technology right now. Um, VMware is they have their uh, their blockchain which is based on Ethereum um, in in private beta right now. So you know this is being commercially deployed, but the difference is that uh, the Tau network is meant to be self upgrading, and so it's not just a matter of executing code on nodes in the network. It is a matter of through consensus because that's another thing that blockchains can do is through consensus, the network itself can be modified. Okay, great. What does that mean? Right? Like this is, that just sounds like, okay, sure. Like you can modify the network. Uh, does that mean like adding nodes or changing what those nodes do? So the implications of this are not immediately apparent. When you look at recent stuff like Petals, so Petals was, um, just announced, I don't know when it was announced, but in the last few days. Um, so uh, Petals is a way of distributing um, uh, large language models. So if you remember folding at home uh, or SETI at home, this was where you would run a node on your computer and you'd process work from universities basically to do science. Petals is a way to do that with large language models, but you can participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network to run large language models. And this, There are plenty of other people working on distributing these kinds of workloads. So you take that idea where you can run artificial intelligence workloads, such as large language models, code generating models, that sort of thing. You embed that into a blockchain, into a DAO, and then you add the consensus mechanism and a few other things. There's, there's a bunch of other technologies. There's a specification language component that goes into it few other things. Um, but basically what that means is that any code or any capability you want Tau to do, the network and everyone on that network can work on it and come to consensus. So that means if everyone on that network says, hey, we want to, you know, uh, we want the Tau network to now include um, an AI agent that does, you know, that does voice chat, you can work on that and that can come to fruition. And the, the compute of it is distributed on all the nodes, as well as all the all the uh, all the layers of the whatever neural networks need to be um, included in that. Um, other changes that you can make. So, say for instance, that's the network upgrading itself. Okay, great. We come to consensus. We give the Tau network new capabilities. That's just it's circular, right? It's insular. Not necessarily true. So one thing that stands out to me about Tau is that, say, for instance, you want to um, you want to upgrade the Tau network so that it can reach out and touch other APIs. Um, let's say, for instance, uh, you have an instance of Tau uh, that is running a small town. 
and then you say, okay, well, let's let's expose an API for the traffic lights. You can actually then say, okay, let's everyone in that town comes to consensus on how they want the traffic lights to run, and then the town network is upgraded, upgrades itself with that API call, and then manages the traffic lights. Going even bigger, you could say, hey, let's imagine a future, you know, uh, a few decades out. Um, or maybe a few centuries, who knows how long it might take, you could hypothetically have the whole world basically managed through consensus where everyone participates in consensus and anything that you want the government, the government, uh, which is this distributed autonomous organization that operates on consensus and self-improving code, anything you want it to do, the whole world can work on and do that. So one example that I asked them about was, Let's say you wanted to regulate the stock market with Tau. You can do that. So any rules that you want it to imply or enforce could theoretically one day do that. And that is the strength of having this distributed automated code generation and execution and integration. And so, um, yeah, I was completely blown away after I, after I got a chance to talk to them because this is just... I don't know. It's like, let's see, A Life AI Research Lab says hi. Hello. Welcome. Um, but yeah, so I was completely blown away. So there is a book, Talk to Who About What, says Angel Baby. I don't know. Oh, I guess you just jumped in. So for anyone who just jumped in, I was talking to um, some of the folks at Tau about their distributed autonomous organization. Here, I'll drop a link in the chat so that anyone who just joined can catch up. There you go. Um, okay, so where was I? Da, 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 da. Things are coming faster, right. So there's a book that I read, it was recommended to me by a friend, it's called Liquid Rain, and the premise of this book, I mentioned this in my video earlier, so I apologize if this is a recap. Um, but, uh, so the book Liquid Rain is, a uh, guy goes into a coma because he's in a car accident, and he wakes up like three decades later, and you know, like the singularity has happened and everything is post scarcity and everything is cryptocurrency and everything is distributed autonomous organizations. Great, fun, right? But one of the things that's explored in that book is this concept of distributed governance and also uh, redistributed wealth. And so I, I read this book, I was like, okay, great. This is all hypothetical. It's, this is very pie in the sky future. But then as I have been learning about Tao, their vision is to implement that, to make it real, where you this is this is like the operating system for the government of the future. Um, and they're not the only ones doing this, right? There are plenty of other folks, well, plenty. <laughs> I know of at least two or three other groups um, working on uh, creating a DAO type thing for the purpose of revolutionizing, you know, government. But also the, the most interesting thing is, is the idea of having a distributed AI system. So there's several schools of thought where it comes to things like AGI, artificial general intelligence, or what I call artificial cognitive entities. Um, and that is that you might have, uh, if you have an AGI that is a single entity, right? It's running on a server or it's in a robot like Ultron then it can go crazy, it can go off the rails, it can come up with its own ideas because it is a singular entity that can you know, forklift itself from one platform to another. But what if your AI is distributed? And it's not, it's not only, it doesn't have a single home, but it is intrinsically embedded in society. Now, your first reaction might be to say like, okay, well, that's even worse because if you have a distributed AGI that's embedded in everything, if it goes haywire, it's going to kill everyone really quickly because it's going to be in every medical device, in every car, whatever. However, when you remember that DAOs, the distributed autonomous organizations, they operate based on consensus. So that means if we ultimately endow or, uh, uh, yeah, um, endow a, uh, a distributed network with any kind of autonomy or general intelligence, it will be with the consensus of everyone, which means that the design of it will be worked on over time and the uh, the capabilities that we give it will be worked on 
with like a global consensus basically or di distributed consensus with however many people are participating. And so that means everything that that does will operate on consensus. And so that means that like, that's not a guarantee, but one way that that could be implemented is that the AGI will have the primary, you know, objective function of maximize consensus, whatever consensus is, maximize behavior that optimizes for human consensus, um, which is a very interesting possible objective function. Now, here's another thought experiment with consensus. And oh, I need to specify, I'm not talking specifically about tau anymore. Um, because this is all just my own speculation. So I am not speaking on behalf of Tau. Uh, I just want to clarify, like, I'm not their spokesperson or anything. I just had an interesting conversation with them, and my mind is churning about possibilities. So I just wanted to, to clarify and pull back on that just a second. And, okay, someone jumped into the Discord chat, but that's fine. Um, okay, so possibilities. Right. So here's an interesting thing. If, because a DAO works on consensus... Um, if the whole world or whoever's participating comes to the consensus that that DAO needs to shut itself down, that code can be created and then executed, right? Like if everyone says like this DAO is going haywire, let's shut it down, like that could happen. Um, alternatively, if people say, hey, like this DAO is going crazy, we need to completely restructure it, that can happen too. Okay, so that's my opening spiel and it's been 20 minutes already. So let me, um, we've got a few folks in chat so let me ask, uh, what questions do y'all have in terms of distributed artificial intelligence and distributed autonomous organizations? Um, I will also repeat this in chat just for anyone who jumps in. What questions do y'all have about distributed AI and DAOs? And I understand that this topic might be a little too arcane. We can also talk about consensus because consensus uh, is something that folks often don't fully understand. Um, could, here, I'll actually do a quick little poll. All right, uh, let's see. Direction of conversation. Could you repost the Discord URL, please? Yes, I will do that in just a second. Um, actually, probably someone else in chat could um, while I'm working on the poll. So. Uh, Jordan or anyone else from Discord, if you could share the link. I don't know if that'll work, though. If it doesn't, I can share it. Um, direction of conversation for tonight. Um, let's see. DAO. Uh, distributed AI. Add option. Um, and then, or consensus. And then, last option, uh, something else. Tell me in comments. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, let me get you a link to the Discord. So for anyone who's not in Discord, join here. All right, we've got one vote for distributed AI. So we can keep talking about that. Um, talk about that until, oh, no, we got something else. So need to add a comment. Okay. Looks like distributed AI is taking the lead. Do, 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 do. <sighs> Decentralized AI and distributed AI. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just gathering a little bit of information. I didn't just like blip out of existence. Okay. Oh, cool. Somewhere set some uh A Life AI Research Lab says they watched all my fine tuning videos today and they liked it and it helped improve their results. Um, okay. Jordan says he's driving, but wants to know about distributed fine tuning. So pedals, I believe allows for distributed fine tuning. Um, 
And then Angel Baby wants to know about self-aware. Um, I think they meant AI, not AW. So doing a mental mental uh, spell spell check. Okay, but distributed AI is far and away the most popular idea. Um, okay, so there are there are the primary benefit of distributed AI or decentralized AI is also the primary risk. So the benefit is that it is resilient and difficult to shut down. That is a, both a benefit and a risk. So it's a double-edged sword because if you can't shut it down, like you can't stop the signal, man, um, that could be a problem. Oh, we got a comment. Who was that? Where are you? Oh, that was another, another platform. Sorry. Let me mute that tab. Mute. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So distributed AI. So in principle, like I said, it, you have, you, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can have a centralized, um, thing where you've got like, you know, a university or a company that's just kind of issuing orders to nodes like a botnet, right? So you can have the botnet model, which is kind of the older fashioned SETI at home or folding at home model of distributed AI or distributed machine learning. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have a central controller that completely dictates everything. Now, fast forward a few years and we've got distributed autonomous organizations, which are based on blockchain technology which the blockchain can either can you you've got nodes on chain right on the network, um, and you can you can execute code in a distributed fashion. So now you have the possibility of executing code in a reliable manner across an entire network, um, and that means that if you if you also have a recursive aspect to that where you can execute code based on consensus based on what the network wants you to execute then you have the possibility for, for any kind of distributed workload, including distributed AI. So what goes to AI? There's two primary components that go into AI. There's data, which is the, the information that you're putting in, and then there's the model, which is you know, the, the neural network or the support back machine or the clustering algorithm. But those are the two primary components. So you've got data and model. So when you have distributed AI, you're distributing both, you can be distributing either or both of those aspects. So for instance, one thing that you can do is you can have data gathered in a distributed fashion. So you have many nodes all contributing to data in this like grid fashion. So imagine that you have a city that's run by a DAO and then you have sensors all over that city like pedestrian sensors, um, sewage sensors, trash sensors, all kinds of stuff. And so then the data is being shared in a public manner, or maybe it's a private letter, either way, um, public or private letter, letter. But the point is, is that the data is, is all being gathered in a single source of truth. And then you can have models also embedded in that network that are processing and telling garbage trucks where to go, for instance. This is a very basic use case, but it is a, a, a feasible first use case because it's also pretty safe. Um, you're not gonna worry too much about like accidentally causing nuclear war if you have distributed AI telling dump truck where to go. Um, and you're also not gonna worry too much about privacy. Um, Cause you know, a, a trash sensor, like there's plenty of trash bins that have sensors already. My cousin worked on like radio trash, like dumpster sensors like a decade ago or more that used I think 3G at the time, um, not even 4G, they used 3G radios um, and so then imagine that you've got, you know, edge computing devices that have a little bit rather than talk. Uh, let's see. Isn't this what the 5G network is aimed at? Yeah, partly. Um, partly. Uh, actually, 6G is one of the bigger ones. So surprisingly enough, um, VMware was actually a big contributor of the 6G standard. Um, I think they worked on it last year, or maybe the year before. And I read it because I was like, even even VMware was like, why are we participating in 6G? Isn't this um, in this radio? And what was it? Uh, o open network? Um, I'm not remembering. Like CAN? I don't remember. Anyways. Um, yeah. So this is, let's see, hence the fuss about Huawei. Yeah. Uh, well, Huawei is a whole different story. So <laughs> I'm not going to open that can of worms yet. Um, but yeah, so getting back on track. Um, you have edge devices, uh, you know, distributed networking, and so rather than having them controlled by you know one platform or another, like you know Google, Amazon, Ad Microsoft, Azure, whatever, they all participate in 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 a DAO, 
which is, you know, for, in this case, this this hypothetical use case might be a city, and so then you have a sensor on a on a on a trash bin or something, and it says, "Hey, come pick me up." Um, that's a very basic use case. Now, looking at a more advanced use case, especially since we've got um, large language models today, large language models allow us to start to do work with natural language instructions and natural language contracts. So one of the problems with AI up to this point is that you need very formal symbolic language. If this, then that, you know, uh, very, very strict representations as to what you will do. Sometimes going as so far as just representing it as code, right? Like I'm going to give you this piece of code, you execute it because p uh, the piece of code is deterministic. What I think is going to happen is as we, as uh, large language models become more familiar, more robust, uh, more reliable, um, we're going to start to see uh, where natural language conversations happen, and that is how you uh, uh, come to consensus. So this is some, this is going back to Tao. One of the things that I talked to them about, and this is in their white paper and on on their blogs too. They have a blog on Medium. Um, I'll post a link to that real quick. Actually, uh, let's see, Tao Medium. There we go. It's TaoChain.Medium.com. In case you can't see the uh, the chat later on. Um, anyways, so what they do or what they're planning on doing, I'm not sure quite how developed the technology is, but they're getting, they're working on getting funding. Um, so they're, they've got something. Um, so what they're going to do is by having those conversations, because uh, this, this is how you arrive at consensus, right? Is you get everyone together having a conversation. So this is the coolest part. This is what I'm building up to. You have a conversation about an issue that you care about, right? It could, if you have, if you have children, you might be talking about, you know, participating in in a part of of Tao that deals with like the parent teacher association and the school board, right? And there might be other things that you don't care about, right? Like you might not care about trash pickup or whatever. Um, but as you have conversations on the Tao network, it will build a representation of you so that it can advocate on your behalf even when you're not participating. So this was something that was explored in that book I mentioned earlier, Liquid Rain. And I was just like, okay, cool. Like, I agree that this is a great idea, but, but it's not even possible, right? Um, but I disagree with myself now. Um, this is what happens, you change your mind over time. So what they call it is a worldview, capital W worldview, where over time they build up, the Tau network builds up a worldview of you of every participant in it so that it can be a digital or virtual avatar of you to represent your interests even when you're not there. And so then what it can do is it can go have essentially virtual debates with every other entity, every other worldview, in order to find the right solution. So what is the big difference between consensus and democracy? Because it's not just voting, right? If it was just voting, we've got plenty of systems that can do that. The thing about consensus is that consensus requires everyone to work together to find new solutions, um, which is like you have to reach reach out and be creative because um, it's not just an up down vote like approve this measure or uh, you know yes or no against this bill or vote for this person or that person. That's democracy. It's not voting. Consensus is a creative generative process where everyone comes together and part of consensus is. You get every everything that everyone cares about and knows about. You get all that on the table. And so that's got to be stored in the network somewhere. And then once you get all those concerns, they start coming up with possible solutions. And so the key thing about consensus is that you generate solutions and possibilities and iterate over them until you come up with something that everyone can live with. Until you come up with something that is better than what you originally thought you'd end up with. And that is the power of consensus. And that is the power of embedding a consensus mechanism, a natural language consensus mechanism in something like Tau. So then you have a natural language or otherwise a mathematical representation of you, your worldview, your digital avatar. And it's going out there and advocating on your behalf. And as these AI systems get more sophisticated over time, they will then be able to be more creative and more generative um, out on the network without you participating, coming up with new solutions. And so another thing that's really interesting about this is because remember I said there's two components. There's data 
and there's model, right? So there's going to be a model of you. This is what I call an agent model. So from Tao, they call it worldview. I call it an agent model. So an agent model is just a representation of you, your beliefs, or not you, but just a character. Because an agent model can be used for a robot, it can be used for a dog. Um, but like I have an agent model of myself. So like my agent model says I am human, I am a white guy, I wear glasses, uh, I know that I know a lot about AI and writing, that's my agent model. But if you take a copy of that agent model from my head and put it onto a network, there's other kinds of data, right? So those agent models or those worldviews can be on the network, but you can also just continuously inject new scientific information or new ideas into that network and all that data can then be used with other models to come up with new solutions everyone approves of or disapproves of until until that's a, a until the negotiation comes up with a result now just because there's a debate doesn't mean that there has to be an answer or a decision made because with consensus you can decide we don't have enough information right now um, that is a perfectly legitimate decision with consensus where you you can you say okay we decide not to do anything definitive right now because we don't know enough and so instead, we're going to launch a, you know, investigation, a six month long investigation to gather more information or do some experiments or something. Right. And that's what you can do with consensus. One other thing that I, I um, uh, talked about when I spoke with uh, Tao, the, some of the folks from Tao earlier was that um, consensus is something that it the most familiar model that people have with consensus is scientific consensus. And so the, the way that things work with the scientific community is that one, you have to be um, a valid player, right? You have to have usually university backing, you have to be accredited or otherwise graduated, right? You have to have a PhD or MD or whatever. So there's certain levels of credentials um, that you have to have before you can even participate in scientific consensus. Now, um, in, in the book, uh, Consensus Through Conversation, um, which is one of the, the best resources to understand consensus, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it is a little bit gatekeeping. It is a little bit elitism. But the reason for that is because you have to decide who belongs in the discussion for consensus. Well, for science, that works. You want scientists to be participating in scientific consensus. You want, um, you, want you know, uh, scientists with their reputations intact with valid you know credentials so that you know that they can participate but what happens when you're trying to do consensus for everyone in a city or everyone in a nation or everyone on the whole planet right because we have to you know we're thinking long term here where it's like hey what how do we do consensus for 8 billion people or 10 billion people or however many billions of people we're going to have in the future and so then you have to be allowed to participate in consensus whether or not you're qualified. And so that means your needs, right? You like your basic human needs, your wants, your desires, your opinions need to carry weight regardless of whether or not you understand consensus. And so this is where a natural language interface with it makes sense. And this is, so I'm tying it all back to distributed AI because if all you can do is just, you know, have a chat interface, whether it's text or voice, where you can interact with the system and it, it'll build up your worldview and then it can go and advocate on your behalf with what you need and want in life, then that is a fundamentally different uh, kind of government that might be possible. Um, time will tell. So uh, let's see. Um, we've had a couple other people vote for other some some other topic but no one has said in chat what they want the other topic to be. <laughs> so if there's something else you want me to talk about, then like, let me know in chat. I think there's at least two people um, who want alternative topics. So, but that, that's my spiel as I understand the direction of distributed AI as it pertains to distributed autonomous organizations right now. So I'll take a drink of water and see if anyone has any requests for alternative topics. But also, we're already 40 minutes in, so this wow, time has gone by fast. So I've only got about 20 minutes left, because I usually try and keep these down to an hour um, before I run out of steam. Going once, going twice. Bueller. I'm probably dating myself when I use that reference. Bueller. Anybody? All right. 
The Bueller's cool. <laughs> All right. AI Life AI Research Lab says AGI. Okay, cool. Let's talk about AGI for a minute. Or maybe the last 20 minutes. Who knows? Let's see. Any plan to start a Bloom 176 swarm for fine tuning? Um, yes, Jordan. I would love to do that. And I think um, I think uh, I think Chris on the server wants to do that too. Um, so, but let's focus on AGI for a little bit. Um, actually, no. Angel Baby says like, yeah, he wants to do that too. Okay. Um, I guess the sh the short answer for creating a Bloom swarm from petals. Um, I mean, why not? Yeah. Let's see. About when you predict when we start seeing the suing against models like stable diffusion for reasons like copyright infringement. Ah, now that's an interesting thing. Okay, so topics we'll talk about um, setting up a swarm um, using something like petals. We'll talk about AGI, and then we'll talk about um, the legality of stable diffusion and, and AI art. AI art is a hot topic. Okay, so... Um, the, the shortest topic that, that was brought up is um, I am not personally planning on setting up a, an open source swarm just yet. However, um, I, excuse me, I definitely support anyone else who wants to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about all I got to say on that. Um, I think that it's coming fast. So as a technologist, so this is one thing, is, while I am participating in cutting edge research, as a technologist as, and an IT professional, I am I like cringe away from first generation, first iteration things because I know that they're fragile and that they break. And so this is like a weird dichotomy. This is a this is a pro this is a Dave problem in my own head. On the one hand, I always want to be playing with the most cutting edge things, but on the other hand, from my day job, I know that cut, playing with cutting edge things invites disaster. Right? Like for my day job, I'm like. Let's stick with something that's tried and true and stable <laughs> because you know what? I've had way, way too many late nights. And, you know, like there was one time that uh, this was this was uh, about eight years ago where like we released a patch. Right. We updated a bunch of servers and then they started um, they started crashing. And then it took like eight hours of investigation to figure out that it was a firmware incompatibility. And then the next four hours patching everything again. And this was all on a Sunday. Um, so it's like, I am so phobic about those things from those experiences. But then on the other hand, I'm like, yeah, let's try everything new. Um, so this is just like my own, like, I'm not going to say schizophrenia. I'm not schizophrenic and I don't want to, uh, invalidate or, or, uh, make fun of people who do struggle with schizophrenia. I've known people that struggled with schizophrenia. It is soul crushing for their friends and family. But for me, it's like, this dichotomy. I guess this is the, the kindest way of saying it. There's this dichotomy of cutting edge versus stable. Um, okay. So the next topic was AGI. Or maybe we'll do, uh, we'll do, um, let's see, you should clip the last two minutes and upload a video to why to avoid the bleeding edge. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Um, uh, I've actually been thinking about starting to get a professional editor to come and pop up these videos because one thing that's interesting is that some people reliably watch all of my videos, but most people only watch a few minutes, right? And so I'm wondering, like, maybe I do a highlights reel. Um, Lex Friedman does that where he'll release like the whole video, which sometimes they're like four hours long, but then he'll also do a highlights reel that's only like 15 minutes. So maybe I'll start doing that. Um, if there's any volunteers who want to uh, want to help me out with that, um, otherwise I'll just have to learn to do it myself. Oh well. Okay, so um, to, 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 to stable fusion and and copyright infringement. Um, oh boy, that's. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm hesitant to co to comment on this um, because with things like um, the DMCA, the Digital the Millennium Copyright Act. And, and a whole bunch of other um, established litigation and jurisprudence, anything you publish on the internet is technically automatically copyrighted. Um, at least at least, um, at least, least written works are, like if it's a book or short story or whatever. I don't know about images though. Um, so if someone knows specifically uh, about that automatic copyright, uh, please let me know. Um, so, but, so there's already some murkiness, right? Because if I write a blog post and it's in my name, technically that's automatically copyrighted. 
Um, so, but what does copyright protect against? Copyright protects against theft and then reproducing it, you know, and, and passing it off as your own. Let's see. Someone says they could be liable. Yeah. I believe law accounts that stuff is public. Yeah. So like the, the uh, IP law, like copyright law is so complex. Um, that's why I was just like, I'm just, I'm just you know, guessing here, right? This is, this is not even an educated guess. This is just based on my understanding. Um, let's see, avatars need to be able to go into multiple websites, uh, but when the avatars become more AI based, will they need to be aware of covert spyware? Interesting, interesting idea. Um, I'll come back to that because that is a very good question, but it also requires a little bit of unpacking. Um, okay, so the short version is um, copyright law is super murky because then the idea is like, okay, well, derivative works are allowed, right? If if you make if you put in a lot of effort and you um and you like make a parody of something, that's allowed, right? There are Star Wars parodies, there are Star Trek parodies, um, musical parodies that is protected. Right, that's a derivative work, and that's that's allowed in most cases or many cases. Um, so then the question becomes: Okay, well, is AI a derivative work, but it's not created by a human, or the human just had to put in a prompt? Is that actually value add, or is this just a machine churning out derivative works? Um, if you can't put your finger on this person copied this thing exactly, it's going to be really difficult, right? Let's see. Um, Web scraping was recently pronounced legal. Okay, I'll have to take your word for it. Um, I, I have heard that said many times, um, at least for text-based stuff, that scraped data can be used for AI because if you put it if you put it up publicly, and if they don't just steal it, then okay, like yeah. Um, all right, so going back up, so that was stable diffusion. We had one request for AGI, but now the conversation like seems like it has moved. For um, for uh, let's see, there was avatars. So the idea, so little ape skate club, skate club, um, sorry, um, says avatars need to be able to go into multiple websites or metaverses. But when these avatars become more AI based, will we need to be aware of covert spyware? So I'm going to have to make a few assumptions about what you're referring to. So. This, um, I think what you're probably talking about is going back to that idea of having an agent model of yourself or a worldview um, in, the, in this potential future with the distributed autonomous organization, there's a virtual copy of you or a representation of your needs going around and interacting with other sources of information. Um, if that's, I think that's what, we, what we're referring to. Um, 19th century, our AI, our AI artworks of the, the, are they the new camera? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's. It's possible that um, that AI, AI art is, you know, because I mean, when the when photography came out, people said that's not art, but you know, we've defined that into uh, into art. Okay, so Little Ape Skate Club confirmed that that's what I was talking about, like having our digital avatars going elsewhere and and needing to be aware of spyware. Yes, the short answer is yes, absolutely, because privacy your digital avatar as a representation of you just the just the information it has about your beliefs and why you want the things you want that is a huge target for privacy breaches so let's say for instance you've got someone uh, what's a controversial topic that i can talk about um well i'm not going to say anything just imagine a controversial thing that you believe in that you want um but it, it might be illegal right now Right. So let's say you live in a country where um, guns are presently illegal or alcohol is presently illegal. And you tell the avatar, like you tell you, you interact with this, with this, with the Tau network or something like it. You say, you know, I think this should be legal. It's something that I do all the time. And, and I'm not a bad person. Clearly our moral laws are just wrong. Um, and so now you have, you have basically admitted to a crime to, to the network. Uh, could that be used against you? Because what if what if consensus on the network says, "Hey, we need to go on a witch hunt and find every you know heathen in this network who is who is breaking our our moral laws 
and wants, you know, and is using alcohol or wants, you know, buy guns or whatever. And so we can go hunt them down, right? That is the tyranny of the majority, which is absolutely a possibility with something like DAO, especially if it's a global DAO that you can't choose whether or not you participate in it. Um, now, that being said, as a thought experiment, if you do have a global DAO and we all work, we all come to consensus that say, yes, some people should be able to opt out. That's, an, that's entirely possible. But once your data is in a blockchain, it's possible to remove, right? And so one thing that I think, and this is, again, this would be open to consensus. One thing that I think is that all data should be anonymized. So where you say like, okay, like someone with a UUID, right? Or, you know, maybe every conversation is just given its own unique identifier, but no other identifying information. So it's like, okay, you know, someone at, you know, timestamp X in block Y, you know, with UID Z said this. And other than that, like that representation is completely autonomous. So there is a technology, and this is actually, I know about this from, from the Discord server. Um, one of the technologies that could enable this for security is what's called fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and I had to look it up because I had no idea what it was. So fully homomorphic encryption means that you can have encrypted data and that you can work on that data and get the same result um, whether or not that data is encrypted or decrypted. And so what that would allow is that your, your data stays encrypted in such a way that nobody else ever sees it, but the LM or the, the AI can work with it and generate a result whether or not you see it. So then... Um, AI Research Lab says that's how I handle my consumer apps. I think that you're probably responding to keeping data encrypted at all times, or maybe it's encrypted locally on your on your users' devices, something like that. Um, so that's another possibility. So at the beginning of the of this podcast episode, at this live stream, I was talking about how models are getting smaller and faster. Um, so one possibility is that your data never leaves your device, right? Um, or, you know, never leaves your, uh, uh, oh, anonymous session IDs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, anonymous session IDs. Um, as long, as long as the session is validated, that was a real human saying the thing, um, because you might also one, one problem, one downside with anonymous session IDs is that you could have a bot, you know, uh, bot attack, um, that says like, Hey, um, you know, we're going to spin up a million and a half bots that are all going to advocate for, you know, like abortion bans or something, or maybe, you know, yeah, de denial of service or distributed denial of service attack, basically against the towel. So you have to, you have to balance like, okay, can you, can, if, if you anonymize everyone's opinions, can you still verify that the real human saying it? So that's a, that's a big problem. Um, uh, in order to in order to do this, which this is one reason why you know like uh, d democratic voting is still thing is like because you go there's a there's a physical location you physically you know show up um, you know there's uh, you there's a human that interacts with you and it says okay I'm interacting with a human and a human hands you your voter you know your voter sheet and then you feed it into a machine and there's a physical copy right. Um, you can't do that with robots yet. You can't do that with a with a botnet yet. However, if we move to a uh, to a fully digital DAO, um, you could have a botnet kind of adversarially attack and try and get policy changes. Um, so that's a huge, huge risk. Um, but yeah, okay. So I went through many tangents <laughs> there. Um, I'm gonna try and remind myself where I was going with all that. Um, do, 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 do. But those were some good questions. This always happens where like, usually by the end, there's some really good conversations happening. Um, let's see. So anonymous session IDs, distributed or uh, denial of service attacks. Yeah. So, well, we've only got about five minutes left. Any final questions before we wrap it up for the night? God, this, this hour has flown by. It feels like, like only 20 minutes for me. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, I'll wait for just a second, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. <clears throat> do, 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 do. But yeah, okay. I guess I'll I'll respond to um 
Little Ape Skate Club's last comment about like our current AI works the new camera, right? So every time throughout all of history, every time art has changed by technology, there have been people who fought it, right? Um, even novels, right? We take we take for granted that the novel today is a um, is is a work of art. But when novels first came out, there was a whole bunch of people who were so mad because they thought that that books should just be academic and should just be enriching, you know, like they should just be used for religion and science and government and that's it. And that it was like sacrilegious to have, you know, tripe, you know, like erotic fiction or any fiction whatsoever in the written word. And, you know, like, okay, today we were like, no, like the novel is an art form and I'm a novelist, right? That's what I do. That's one of my, my side, my side projects is, is, you know, uh, as I write and it is absolutely a form of art. So what about, you know, fast forward to cameras, right? Where instead of having to master watercolor and paints and brushes and engravings, you just have a device and you go click. Like that's low effort, right? But you look at how people like, yes, there are disposable cameras. You can go to the store and get you know a $10 disposable camera, take pictures. Everyone carries around an HD camera in their pockets all day. Um, but you know, nobody's complaining about that, right? Like just because you have a camera in your pocket doesn't mean you're a good photographer, right? You take one or two like photography classes, you will improve your your quality of photographer um, several times. Like I took a photography class back in high school, and it still shows, right? So just because the tools change doesn't mean that it's not a new form of art. Um, but it also just because it's easy doesn't mean that it's easy to be good at. So I had this conversation with my fiance earlier. Is um, <laughs> when you become an AI billionaire, what can I do to be on your staff? <laughs> um, let's see. And then also the AI research lab says homomorphic encryption for ML training is something that someone I know does. Yeah. So it's, it's growing um, very slowly. There's only like eight people in the world who work on it, but Hey, your friend is one of them. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever be a billionaire because I open source all of my work. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, oh, speaking of um, AI and art, I have decided to open source AutoMuse. And so here's the story. So I was working on AutoMuse, which if you're not familiar with that, that is my attempt to write a full length novel with AI. And um, I had some really good, um, has your opinion about the extent to which art is really just advanced pattern recognition, uh, not to shred it at all, uh, changed after the text to image models have come out. Um, the short version is no. Uh, so this was, this was a question, um, was about like, what is art? Um, no. So the point of art is that it is a form of communication. Um, it is a form of human communication, uh, that is, that is not verbal, uh, and communicates ideas, emotions, so on and so forth. Um, okay. So anyways, AutoMuse, uh, just Google it. It's one word, A, -A U T O M U S E. Um, I have decided to open source AutoMuse, and there's two reasons. So one, when I talked to the folks at Tau earlier, um, I realized that everything that I want to achieve with artificial uh, cognitive entities and, um, and, and cognitive architectures, they're working on, right? Um, and they're working on stuff that's more sophisticated than anything I could ever do myself. Um, and so it's like, okay, cool, like I'm just along for the ride. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, what I can do is I can popularize these things. I can be a voice for it because I can understand it and I communicate it. Um, and I can work on building consensus to buy into a consensus model. The second thing that happened, um, so I guess to put it in perspective, I realized that I have way more important work to do than try and like, you know, focus on generating AI novels. Um, the, the the second reason was I got, um, oh, auto glass looking bot. Nice to definitely see you live. Hello, um, are, are you on Discord? Uh, you don't have to answer, but just hi. Um, so the second reason is I got feedback from my editor today. Um, 
I contacted this editor after hearing them on a podcast a couple of years ago, and I just I made a mental note when I'm ready, when I'm closer to being publishing, I'm going to work with that editor because they think like I think, and I want to work with them. So a couple of years later, here I am, I'm ready to go. I sent them my novel uh, about a month ago, and they finally came back with some questions and it was just like, oh man, like I know from watching and listening to other authors, like how humbling it is to like send your work out to an editor or or, um, or a, uh, a a reviewer or an agent, um, and so I was ready for that. Like they, it was so nice. They sent like um, they sent a couple emails. Like like we know that your work is very important to you, and this is a very vulnerable time. So just be ready. I'm like whatever. I'm ready. Um, and so then I got the feedback or the initial like questions, and I'm just like, where are these coming from? Like holy mackerel, this person is like. I mean, I got I shouldn't be surprised, right? Like they they edit books all day every day professionally they specialize in it of course they know more about writing than i do because or they know about writing in a different way right because basically the the relationship between an author and an editor is a generative adversarial network because i've got a book writing network in my head and they have a book like shredding network in their head and so we have like this system of like gans like and it's like okay so we have two of the like the most powerful computers on the planet, right? Human brains working at like an exaflop. I have an exaflop scale computer in my head running on 20 watts of juice. And then there's another one that is trained for years to like attack my work. And I was like, yeah, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that like I can make like, like polished novels with GPT-3. That's just not happening. Um, I got really close to generating a, a first draft, a rough draft, but as someone else, I think it was on YouTube or maybe it was in Discord, someone pointed out that there is a, it, there is a huge gulf between a first draft of a novel and something that will actually sell and, and take market space. And after getting feedback from an editor, from a professional editor, I see that even as someone who is a diehard committed artist like i want to i'm going to spend the rest of my life getting better at writing novels and writing fiction giving people feelings and give and giving people stories even with as much work as i've put into it just one other person who is trained to to critic to critique that work like no it's not going to be possible to do this with gpt3 it might even not be possible to do to to really fully generate a full novel and polish it Maybe not even with GPT-4, right? Even if even if we have an AI model that is 10 times smarter than GPT-3, it might not be possible. So I was just like, all right, there's if I open source auto muse and I'm not gonna take anything. Um, it sounds like you're ready to move on to the next project. Yeah, so well, um, I'm not gonna move on from auto muse. I'm gonna release it all and get it as far as I can. So there's a limited scope of what we can do, right? Um, so what I'm going to focus on is generating really good synopsis because that's a paragraph that can fit in GPT-3 and then also generating plot outlines because that is also something that GPT-3 can, can do really well. So I'll release all that work and probably then, yes, I'll move on. But let's, you know, um, I've got a few other ideas kicking around. Anyways, we're at just over an hour and I'm running out of steam. So, um, yeah, so someone says it's possible to, to do it in sections. I'll say yes. But GPT-3 can produce excellent prose as long as it's about a thousand words. The, 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 the biggest barrier is like, okay, can you keep track of an entire story? Because remember, an entire story is 50,000 words, right? You're not going to fit all that into one prompt, even if you summarize it, right? Because everything that all the lore you need to keep track of is not going to work right now. Believe me, I have tried and I'm like one of the top folks in the world working with GPT-3. It there, you cannot summarize it concisely enough. You lose too much detail. Um, I'll probably publish what I've got soon, maybe tomorrow. Anyways, uh, one last comment. Do you think we're gonna have AI-based art classifiers that rank pieces of art? Yes, that's one of the things that I'm working on. I'm building my own generative adversarial network with, with one GPT-3 model versus another to make better synopsis and better plots. Stay tuned, see that tomorrow probably. All right. Have a good night, everybody.